Good morning. I'm Robert Litvak, Senior Vice President of the Wilson Center, and I thank you for joining us for this virtual meeting sponsored by the Center, a conversation of how violent non-state actors are behaving during COVID-19. Today's topic is timely and important. Scant attention has been focused on how the pandemic has affected the operations of cartels, gangs, and terrorist organizations. Does this crisis present a challenge or an opportunity for these groups? Today, we have experts on Mexico, Latin America, South Asia, Middle East, and Eastern Europe to discuss how non-state actors in their regions are reacting to the global pandemic and whether or not COVID-19 has fueled extremism and violence by these groups in their parts of the world. The impetus for today's program came from discussions we've had with congressional staffers who are asking the basic questions that we are here today to explore. Today's event is made possible through the collaboration of a number of, of programs within the Wilson Center, the Office of Congressional Relations, the Mexico Institute, the Asia Program, the Kennan Institute, the Latin America program, and the Middle East program. The ex event exemplifies why the Wilson Center is the number one ranked think tank in the world in regional studies and highlights what the Wilson Center does best, bringing together nonpartisan expertise from across the globe. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce Aaron Jones, the Wilson Center's Director of Congressional Relations, who will moderate today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. This is uh, really a pleasure to be able to have this event. I think it really, as, as Robert said, this really exemplifies what the Wilson Center is good at. We are the number one think tank in regional studies, and it's just a wonderful place to be able to work at a place when I'm having a conversation with a congressional staffer wondering how uh, COVID-19 is uh, affecting non-state actors, I'm able to go to the Mexico Institute and to the Latin America program, the Kennan Institute, the Asia program, the Middle East, the Middle East program, and pull together all of these experts that we're going to talk to today. Is this a challenge? Is this an opportunity? If you're a terrorist group, a cartel, criminal organization for cybercrime, are they facing the same supply chain issues that we are? When we go to the grocery store, we try to get products uh, and we try to move Th uh, things across borders, what are they facing? And, and does this present this challenge or is it an opportunity for them uh, to have more criminal activity and to perhaps grow their organizations? So we're gonna explore all of these things today. And our first up today is Duncan Wood, who is the director of the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute. He is an internationally renowned specialist on North American politics, Mexico, US Mexican ties, and he lectures and publishes on hemispheric issues and relations. He regularly gives testimony to Congress here in the United States and in Mexico uh, uh, on their relations and <clears throat> is a widely quoted source on Mexican politics. So Duncan, why don't you give us a start on how uh, these non-state actors are dealing with things in uh, Mexico, Latin America? Thank you so much, Aaron, and uh, thanks to my colleagues for, for, for being on this call with, uh, with me. It's, uh, as uh, both Rob and Aaron have said, it's fantastic to see how the, uh, the Wilson Center's programs can cooperate with each other at times like this. Um, I've got a very brief presentation, Aaron, so I'm gonna share that to my screen right now. Uh, let me see if I can get the, uh, the full screen. Does that look good to you, Aaron? Fantastic, thank you. So um, I want to focus on uh, illicit, uh, illegal non-state actors in Mexico and the way that they've been reacting to the, uh, to the pandemic. And I would say that uh, certainly in the, uh, the popular, uh, in, the, in the press and in the media, we've seen more coverage of what's taking place in Mexico than any other place in the world. Um, uh, I'm grateful that uh, Eric and Louise will be able to talk about these uh, issues in greater depth uh, later on. Um, in other parts of the world. But in Mexico, I think that uh, we've seen three major phenomena uh, or factors here. One is the impact the pandemic has had on the drug supply chains. Secondly, on the levels of violence in the country. And thirdly, how drug cartels, uh, organized crime groups have tried to legitimize themselves uh, through the pandemic. If we start with the first factor on drug supply chains, we have in fact seen that there has been severe um, uh, disruption of the flows of, of certain kinds of drugs from Mexico to the United States. And that has taken two forms. One in terms of the interruptions in the production process. 
uh, both in terms of precursor chemicals that are coming in from Asia and the operation of, uh, of labs in Mexico. And secondly, with uh, actions that are being taken at the border. And in particular, uh, it's very, very important to consider what has been happening at the US-Mexico border in terms of the partial closure of that border um, and just the uh, uh, greatly reduced traffic across that border at these times. So as I said, we're seeing disruptions. Um, perhaps the drug that's being most disrupted is, uh, is, is meth, methamphetamines, and that's because of the interruptions of the, uh, uh, the precursor chemicals coming in from Asia. Um, but there's also a huge amount of, uh, of uncertainty on the part of the, uh, the cartel. Some of you may have seen a very good report actually on NBC News um, over the weekend, which talked about the impact on, uh, on Mexican drug cartels. Um, but there is certainly a perceived uh, increase in police presence during the pandemic, um, partly to, uh, to enforce uh, the guidelines on, on social distancing, stay at home orders, et cetera. Um, but also, of course, as I mentioned earlier on, in terms of the border shutdowns. And so it's become more difficult to move drugs north uh, and, uh, and money south, as it were. Uh, the DEA has said that uh, despite these kind of uh, disruptions, one drug that is still widely available in the United States is fentanyl. Um, that's a, you know, for those of you who, who don't know, a very, very dangerous, very powerful synthetic opioid. Um, and we've seen that, uh, in fact, some people who were taking op uh, heroin before the pandemic have moved on to fentanyl during the, the pandemic because of problems getting uh, access to heroin that they used to get from Mexican suppliers. Cartels themselves appear to be shifting from air and land transportation and uh, seem to be focusing more on shipments by sea to bring product in from Mexico to the US. That is a significant departure in, uh, from, the, from the norm for what we usually see. Um, and uh, we're also seeing that uh, the DEA and, uh, and other authorities um, at Homeland Security, et cetera, are seeing that uh, there are, there's a potential silver lining to what's going on. The disruptions that we're seeing have enabled the, uh, uh, the folks at the border who control the border to actually intercept more drugs moving north. And that's a simple question out of, uh, because as I said earlier on, it's greatly reduced traffic moving across the border. It's actually easier to identify the, uh, the illicit uh, movements that are, that are taking place. Um, just to uh, think about what may be happening beyond the pandemic here, in terms of drug supplies. There certainly appears to be a phenomenon of stockpiling of drugs in Mexico. Drugs that cannot make it across the border um, are being stockpiled. That's having um, a short-term impact in the sense that uh, there are greater seizures or, or seizures of larger amounts of drugs in Mexico at this point in time. Um, but it also suggests that once the pandemic is over and border restrictions are relaxed, that we may see a flood of drugs onto the market, and that will obviously have an impact, uh, a downward impact upon price after the pandemic. In the short term, however, we've actually seen the, sh uh, the shortages of, uh, uh, of methamphetamine, for example, um, uh, causing uh, rises in price in, uh, uh, in, in the United States. Um, let me talk uh, the next uh, uh, element, the next dimension on violence. Uh, unlike other parts of the world, what we've seen in, uh, uh, in Mexico is that violence has gone up throughout this pandemic. We have seen rising levels of violence and the figures for April are just out and they show that in fact there is a jump on uh, homicides from April of last year. Um, the government, uh, as all governments in Mexico have done for many years, try to put a positive spin on these. They say that uh, there has been you know, less of an increase than they expected. But overall, we're seeing a lot of violence in, in the country. In March and April of this year, um, we've seen that uh, over 6,000 people were, were killed. Uh, that's 338 more than in the same period of last year. And in 18 out of the 32 states in Mexico, murders have, uh, have risen again, despite social distancing measures. Um, the state of Guanajuato in the center of the country, traditionally a very safe uh, state in Mexico, um, has uh, had the total, uh, the highest total number of homicides with over 1,500 registered this year. And that's because we're seeing two organized crime groups, the Jalisco Nueva Generacion Cartel and the Santa Rosa de Lima Cartel fighting for control in that state. 
but the largest jumps in violence um, were, were seen in the states of, uh, of Campeche and uh, in uh, uh, and Michoacan and Zacatecas. In fact, Campeche homicides uh, increased by 100% in, uh, in that state. Um, and so there's some very, very worrying trends taking place in, uh, in Mexico. Let me see if I can get back to the, uh, the presentation. Hope you can still see the presentation. Um, the last dimension I want to talk about is that of legitimacy. And for many, many years, of course, the fact that the Mexican federal government, the Mexican state has been absent uh, from large parts of the country or only present temporarily when the army rolls through has given much greater opportunities for organized crime groups to establish legitimacy with uh, local populations. And what we've seen during this pandemic is that as people have struggled during the lockdown with the economic contraction that's been, that's been caused, cartels have stepped into that vacuum. They've been delivering aid to, uh, uh, to local residents. And of course, this is not the first time that we've seen this. Uh, we have the famous example in Colombia of Pablo Escobar and his kind of uh, narco philanthropy. Um, in Sinaloa, we've also seen, of course, in the past that El Chapo and his uh, organized crime group have given money for churches, um, for soccer stadiums, for Lienzos Charros, like the local rodeos. And uh, even the, uh, the Gulf Cartel over in the northeast of the country gave out aid after the uh, Hurricane Ingrid in 2013. This time it's interesting that uh, one of the most violent cartels in Mexico, the Jalisco Nueva Generacion Cartel, has joined in. And uh, this suggests that uh, uh, the Jalisco Nueva Generacion Cartel is becoming more of a, uh, a regular cartel. For a long time it was seen as being one that focused on spectacular violence and was really a disruptor in the space. But this time again, just like uh, all of the, uh, the, the, so the more established cartels, um, the Jalisco cartel is focusing on building up legitimacy and local support. Um, and of course, this is because it is vital to have support from the local population in your home territory. Um, and this uh, helps when the, uh, the army and the police come looking for you. Um, it helps in terms of getting people to, uh, the local residents to support you in terms of, uh, of security and in terms of being part of the business itself. And these two, uh, th these factors all combine, of course, to present another blow to the legitimacy of the, of the Mexican state and the Mexican government of Andres Manuel López Obrador. And unfortunately, of course, this is not great for bilateral relations either. We've seen uh, that uh, the relationship has come under a number of strains during the pandemic to do with the bigger questions of manufacturing supply chains. Um, and prior to the pandemic, we've also seen that there was increased pressure by Attorney General Barr on uh, his Mexican counterparts to get them to do more to stop the flow of drugs. Having such high profile uh, uh, visibility of the cartels uh, giving out aid to local populations and the widespread reporting in uh, not just Mexican media, but especially in media here in the US and around the world, I think that uh, just suggests that uh, you know, the, the, for, the, for US authorities that they are really doubly concerned about the deterioration of, uh, of uh, governance in Mexico. And with that, Aaron, I will stop for now. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take a couple now, um, but I'll be on the call for another 10 minutes or so. All right, thank you, Duncan. And we did get a couple of questions. Uh, one was really with the, uh, the, the, the supply chain question and transportation and you know, what methods do you see transnational actors, both state and non-state, utilizing to continue supplying illicit goods? Um, yeah, so the, so the things, as, as I suggested in the presentation, we've seen that uh, with the tighter border controls, um, more of the product is moving um, via sea routes um, to try to get around the controls on the border. Um, but I think there's a lot that we don't know at this point in time that will become uh, clear later on. I think that uh, we, will, we should expect that uh, we'll see more um, drugs moving, not across the formal uh, border crossings, but across the uh, between border crossings. Um, I, I've uh, been wondering recently if we're going to see increased use of drones to move shipments of fentanyl, for example, because you can make so much money with, such, with a small shipment of, uh, of fentanyl. Um, 
And, uh, you know, the existing methods that uh, a lot of uh, organized crime groups have used, um, sort of using uh, a, a lot of different passengers, because um, the, kind of the so-called ant strategy to move people across the, uh, the border with small amounts of drugs that are in reassembled on the other side, um, that doesn't really work during a pandemic when you've got these uh, tighter border controls in place. And uh, you know, just to go back to that quote from, uh, from DEA and from uh, Homeland Security, you know, normally it's, uh, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack as people are moving across the border because there's so much border traffic. Now the haystack is that much smaller, so it's easier to identify uh, the, uh, the bad people and the bad goods that are coming across. And um, how is the pandemic hindering financial, uh, the, the money laundering methods? Yeah, that's a really good point. I, say. I, I forgot to mention that, mention that in my presentation, so I'm grateful for that. Um, what we're seeing is that it's much more difficult to, uh, to move money south as well across the border. Um, and so sort of the repat repatriation of the profits from the drug trade, we're seeing in fact that there are um, larger uh, caches of cash here in the United States. People are hoarding cash uh, in the illicit drug trade because it's so much more difficult to get it southward, which means that when uh, authorities here in the US actually make a bust, they're finding a lot more money uh, in, in, in situ than they would normally. Um, and so there is an, an extra financial risk for the organized crime groups uh, at this point in time. And all of that, of course, uh, means that uh, there is a, it helps to explain why we've seen this upward pressure in terms of, uh, of violence. As things become more difficult in Mexico with the border restrictions, with less money coming back south, with the difficulties of getting drugs over the border, you've got uh, drug cartels who are competing more intensely than they would normally for the, uh, the pluses, sorry, for the routes to get the, uh, the drugs northward, but also for the pluses in Mexico, and that is the local marketplaces where they're selling drugs there. If you've got a surplus of, uh, of, Ill of illegal drugs in Mexico, you cannot get them over the border. You're gonna make extra efforts to try to sell them in country. And just a reminder to folks, if you wanna send questions to our panelists, uh, you can tweet at the Wilson Center. Uh, or you can send an email to congressionalrelations at wilsoncenter.org and we'll get as many questions to our panelists as possible. Duncan, you mentioned uh, the, the challenge with the murder rate that's uh, been increasing and there's been a particular problem with femicide in uh, Mexico and in Latin America. Um, you know, is, is this coming from these non-state actors, or is this, uh, you know, some a, a societal challenge that's going on, a government's challenge, governance challenge? Uh, where do you, where do you think that's coming from, and is it affected by the pandemic? Yeah, um, it's the answer to that is uh, is kind of all of the above. Um, but before I give a longer answer, let me uh, uh, point our viewers to a really excellent project which is underway at the Wilson Center on gender-based violence um, in, uh, in in Latin America. Um, and we've had uh, already a number of events uh, and publications from that project. That's on the Wilson Center's website. Um, but what we are seeing in Mexico is that we've seen rising numbers of femicides over the past year. But in fact, the latest numbers in Mexico suggest that there has been a slight drop on what we saw last year um, uh, in, in recent months. But those are the official figures, and it's very difficult to, uh, to say whether or not these are, these, this is accurate reporting. What we have seen, of course, like everywhere in the world, is that during the, um, uh, the lockdown, we've seen uh, an increase in, uh, in domestic violence, domestic abuse. Um, and the big challenge there for the Mexican uh, government, I would say, is that the Mexican president in his daily press briefing has a number of times denied that there is domestic violence in Mexico. In fact, he has said that the pandemic and the shutdown is a time of reencuentro familiar, that the families are coming together and he says, no, there isn't actually domestic violence going on in the country, which we all know is false. This has led to an outcry from, uh, from civil society groups, uh, justifiably so. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it, it's further increased the, uh, um, the controversy about whether or not the, uh, the Mexican president is truly in touch with what's happening uh, for the Mexican people. But the um, uh, violence uh, femicides are being committed, yes, by organized crime groups, 
um, but also there is a, a wider social problem, particularly in, in certain parts of the country. For, for decades now, or for more than a decade, we have seen uh, a terrible femicide problem up in the Makila zones, up in the north of the country. Um, you know, prior to the, uh, uh, the outbreak of uh, higher levels of, of drug-related violence around 2007, prior to that, we'd seen a real problem with femicides in the, uh, the, the, the city of Ciudad Juarez, up in the north of the country, right across the border from El Paso. Um, and nobody has really ever got a handle on that. And so this is a problem uh, that stems from organized crime. It's a broader problem in society and, and perhaps the, the social model that is being employed uh, in, uh, in, in parts of Mexico. And it's a problem for the government because of the challenge really to the legitimacy of this administration, which claims to represent El Pueblo, the people of Mexico, but seems to be denying the, uh, the problem that is, that is impacting you know, more than 50% of the population. Thank you, Duncan. And you mentioned uh, the projects that we have going on at the Wilson Center that are dealing with this, this femicide issue and this gender-based violence issue. I wanted to point out we have a new podcast, which is uh, Spotlight Justice for Women, uh, which is looking at, at these issues around the world. And the first couple episodes have been uh, dealing with uh, this particular issue in Latin America. Uh, and also on the subject of podcasts, Duncan is part of a team that has just uh, released America's 360. Uh, which is a new podcast from the Wilson Center. And I would suggest anyone who's interested, especially in this time where a lot of us are working from home, it's a great time to listen to podcasts. I have a podcast, Need to Know. Go on, uh, you can go on the Wilson Center SoundCloud page and find all of our podcasts. You can also find them uh, if you go on the Apple uh, podcast app and just search the Wilson Center and you're gonna find the Wilson Center's uh, podcast. Thank you, Duncan. We'll move Thank to- you, Aaron. Um, and we are going to um, uh, give him some time here. Eric Olson, he is the director of the Central America DC platform for the Seattle International Foundation. Formerly, he was the deputy director of the Wilson Center's Latin American program, and he is um, the, uh, a, a consultant and global fellow uh, for the Wilson Center. Uh, even as we speak. He's an expert on security and organized crime in Latin America and U.S. policy in the region. He's published widely and he's testified before Congress on topics ranging from the crisis in Central America's Northern Triangle to U.S. security in cooperation with Mexico. We're so happy to have you on with us, Eric. Glad that you can be back under the Wilson Center banner here for this. Hey, thanks a lot, Aaron, and thanks to Duncan and my other colleagues at the Wilson Center, and always good to see Louise. Uh, I think this is a really timely uh, topic to be discussing, something that uh, I've been scratching my head a lot about. As you can see, it's, uh, the hair is mostly gone at this point, but trying to figure out what the real impacts are of COVID-19 on organized crime in Latin America. Uh, we tend to talk about gangs, uh, transnational criminal organizations as, a prior, uh, as the main actors in Latin America. So I think this is a really timely uh, topic to look at. Um, I, as I say, it's a little, it's a little uh, premature to know with a great deal of certainty what the impacts have been. Uh, I believe that you know, there's some good, strong anecdotal evidence of how things have cha are changing. But I'd like to offer maybe first four broad assumptions about organized crime and how it operates generally that might be able to guide our discussion uh, this morning. And, and, and Duncan has mentioned some of these already, so apologies for being redundant. But let me start. One, the first is organized crime works best where the state is absent or weakest. It doesn't mean there's no organized crime in strong state situations. Obviously, Washington, D.C., Chicago, New York, all major U.S. cities have some degree of organized crime, but it, but it operates more freely, more openly, and often more violently where the state is absent. Uh, and so I think it's really important to look at how uh, the state and the absence of the state is providing new opportunities for organized crime to not only continue their work, but to even expand it to some areas, to reach new areas of, 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 uh, of geography where the state is now 
being diverted or their attention is being focused elsewhere. Police and militaries in Central America are uh, enforcing lockdown orders, uh, watching and, and observing uh, people who leave their house, checking on them. They're not out necessarily fighting organized crime. So there are new spaces opening up and new opportunities for organized crime to expand. May not be doing it quite yet, but that's certainly something we need to look at. Secondly, organized crime is accustomed to and even uh, expects to have to adopt its, uh, in its operating environment. Operating environments are never uh, smooth and constant over time for organized crime, and they're very good at uh, reorienting their work. Disruptions always occur. Sometimes those disruptions are due to law enforcement actions or rivalries with other criminal groups or even legalization. Legalization of uh, regulation of, of cannabis in the United States has definitely changed the market for organized crime in Latin America. So they're nearly always capable of figuring out some way around it, some way to reach the, the market that they're trying to supply uh, that guarantees their, their revenue. Third, it's important to think about organized crime as a reflection of illicit economies, not just groups of criminals operating together. Capturing or killing a kingpin like El Chapo Guzman in Mexico or breaking up uh, criminal networks like Los Cachitos in Honduras does not eliminate the incentives of an illicit economy. So there's always somebody ready to step in and take advantage of the opportunity that makes uh, to make an illicit profit. You take out Los Cachitos and something comes behind it to take advantage of the opportunity of the illicit economy. Uh, the pandemic offers new opportunities for illicit economies to pop up. New opportunities such trafficking and medical supplies and medical equipment uh, or exploding, exploiting new government emergency programs. Uh, you know, all, all over Latin America, countries have declared emergencies and uh, uh, Congresses have approved major new spending programs like we have in the United States. Well, this offers uh, organized crime new opportunities to uh, take advantage of uh, emergency spending, often which is done with uh, very limited oversight. Um, fourth, organized crime often tries to legitimize itself. Uh, as Duncan said, uh, there's often attempts to uh, legitimize their, their money, uh, to convert dirty money into clean money through money laundering schemes, or uh, they try to legitimize themselves by substituting the state, uh, offering their own social programs uh, or their own security programs where the state is weakest or not present. MS-13, which is built on a model of territorial control at a local neighborhood level, has sought to ensure the safety of its neighborhoods by enforcing public health orders and providing screening for those entering their territories. For example, in Honduras, there are reports of gangs organizing disinfecting campaigns to ensure that vehicles entering their neighborhoods are properly sanitized. So they're protecting themselves, obviously, but also offering to protect their neighborhoods in that way because the government, the state cannot fully uh, accomplish or make sure those things are happening. So in that context, in that broad context of assumptions, let me turn briefly to some of the new challenges and new opportunities that organized crime uh, is uh, experiencing in Latin America. First of all, uh, as uh, we've said, supply chain disruption has, uh, has, um, uh, uh, has occurred. Uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, borders closing down, uh, with uh, new, uh, new security measures uh, that's made uh, transshipment of drugs and cocaine in, particularly, in particular difficult. We know there's a significant uh, increase in stockpiles 
of cocaine along the Colombian Ecuador border region. Uh, coca, coca trees and plantations continue to uh, produce coca leaf uh, and it keeps, it, it continues to be converted, but it's much more difficult now to ship that uh, uh, north to the markets. We've seen some creativity in how to uh, overcome these limitations. Uh, there's a, a very interesting report uh, of a seizure of a boat from Honduras, a seizure in France with one and a half tons of cocaine, uh, and the boat was filled with Honduran coffee and cocaine mixed amongst it. So we see different times new efforts, new routes uh, for uh, shipping because of the limitations in the background. But I would say uh, probably one of the most significant things in disrupting the supply chains has to do with the disruption and legitimate global trade. And that uh, is important for a variety of reasons. As, as, you know, as, uh, as Duncan has mentioned, uh, slowing of trade uh, generally has affected precursor uh, chemicals that are necessary in the production of fentanyl, uh, methamphetamine, and other synthetic opioids. Um, that's the impact has been felt most strongly as uh, trade between China and the United States has decreased in the context of the global pandemic. Uh, and so it's affected those precursor chemicals coming into Mexico and then be, uh, converting uh, uh, methamphetamine or fentanyl. Now, as Don pointed out, the, the availability of fentanyl in the United States is not necessarily going down. That could be possibly that they're reverting to use uh, 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 different packaging services or the US Postal Service, but that, that's clearly uh, impacted. Uh, another is of course, just plain old border crossings. Uh, as Duncan pointed out, the US-Mexico border has been changed significant, significantly, but that's true also uh, in the borders in Central America. Uh, especially the borders between El Salvador and its neighbors, Guatemala, Honduras, and between Nicaragua and Costa Rica, where these border crossings are also affecting uh, the, you know, legitimate trade. But since that legitimate, tr uh, since drugs are often uh, contained in that legitimate trade, it's affecting the trafficking of drugs as well. Now, the 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 speculation is that the problems with trade, uh, uh, the decrease in legitimate trade has most impacted illicit uh, and synthetic opioids since over 90% of the traffic of opioids comes over land and cross borders. Uh, now, reductions in other legitimate traffic, uh, be it aerial, maritime, or land, uh, make it easier to monitor and spot illicit movements as well. As Duncan said, making the, uh, the haystack smaller means that any legitimate uh, traffic uh, is, uh, any illicit traffic is much more visible uh, when out patrolling. And the speculation here is that this will have a particularly strong impact on cocaine trafficking because as much as 88% of cocaine traffic from uh, the Andes region to the United States is via uh, sea or maritime routes. And there's been a major new initiative by Southcom to increase petroleum, uh, uh, patrolling, excuse me, uh, uh, in the Caribbean, Eastern Caribbean, uh, and along the Venezuela, Colombia area, and also in the Eastern Pacific. Pacific. Um, thirdly, and, and, and this is uh, also an important factor, is the issue of bulk cash transfers. Uh, as Duncan pointed out, there's good evidence of increasing uh, seizures of large amounts uh, in the United States as the bulk cash stacks up. Uh, the New York uh, NBC News reported that between March 1 and March 8, uh, there was as much as $10 million uh, uh, seized around in the Los Angeles area. That's more than double what was uh, seized during that same period the year before. So we can see greater volume of bulk cash. Now, why is that happening? Well, part of it is 
uh, that borders are harder to get across and move south. But the other component here is that a big element in uh, trafficking, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in money laundering is what's known as trade-based money laundering. That is using a trade uh, to over, uh, in, to inflate costs, to move uh, money through the trading system uh, between the North and the South, uh, and, and thus, uh, in, you know, bring the money to uh, where it's needed uh, to purchase new products in Colombia or in Ecuador or in Venezuela. But as we say, as legitimate trade has uh, gone down, that same trade-based money laundering um, has also taken a hit and has uh, left uh, much more uh, money stacked up in the United States. Um, thirdly, uh, then lastly, I would just mention that there's been a, you know, a huge decrease uh, in the extortion rackets, which are more prevalent amongst local or organized crime groups. This is a huge source of revenue for gangs in, in, in Central America. Uh, but that business model, if you will, has fallen on hard times is because uh, one, public transport has been uh, closed down in several countries. That's you know, uh, extorting buses uh, and taxis has been a big source of revenue for people. Also, the shutdowns have affected the informal economies in these countries. Uh, Latin America, the informal economy represents roughly 56% of all academic economic activity. Uh, and there are over 126 million Latin American women who are employed in the informal sector. They sell tortillas, they sell uh, snacks, they sell things on the street around the periphery of the markets. Those folks are not working any longer. And so uh, when they don't work, they don't make money, they don't eat, and they basically have nothing left uh, to pay for their taxes, which are really another form of extortion uh, from the gangs and organized crime. So extortion has been affected enormously. Since I'm running out of time, I just want to point out a couple of new opportunities that we see organized crime taking advantage of. First, as I mentioned early, earlier, there's a new demand, uh, a high demand for uh, medical supplies, medical equipment, medicines, and this provides an enormous opportunity for uh, organized crime to engage in contraband, uh, uh, corruption that leads to overpricing. Uh, uh, over 15,000 coronavirus diagnostic tests were confiscated in Brazil at the Brazil airport. Uh, and uh, it was determined that they, this involved a group of 14 people who were trying to, to stole these groups, uh, these products, and were uh, uh, trying to resell them on the open market. In Honduras, the director of the Honduran Social Security Institute said that when loads of protective equipment are delivered to hospitals, items are already missing once they are open. So there's major theft and then reselling on the black market. Other new opportunities, cyber crime, we haven't mentioned that yet, uh, but there are much, many more transactions happening online. Also, there's uh, greater uh, promotion of fraudulent uh, medicines, cures, equipment, uh, all of which uh, are, are new opportunities for revenue for organized crime. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, new emergency government spending programs are often shrouded in secrecy uh, and have resulted in numerous cases of alleged corruption and stealing Bolivian authorities on May 20th fired the health minister and opened an investigation to potential corruption over allegations that those officials bought ventilators at inflated prices and pocketed the difference. Um, so uh, I think in all in all, we are in a situation where there are clearly new challenges. Uh, I believe that organized crime has the capacity to adapt to those new challenges.
that they will. It may not be clear to us yet exactly how that's going to happen. But at the same time, they're seeing some new opportunities uh, in uh, ways to take advantage of government spending, uh, the, the public demand and need for medicines and medical equipment. These are all new revenue streams for organized crime. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And just a reminder to our viewers, if you are interested in sending in a question to our panelists, you can tweet us at the Wilson Center or you can send an email to congressional relations at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, let's see, one that we had come in is, if we expect once border restrictions are loosened, this large influx of drugs that both you and Duncan had talked about um, into the US, how do you think the president administration will or should respond to this outside of their normal means that we have with our drug laws and uh, border checks? Well, this is the perennial dilemma of uh, trying to uh, deal with uh, illicit drugs at the border. Uh, we all know that uh, illicit uh, commerce, illicit trade, uh, legal trade is essential to the livelihoods of us in the United States and people in Mexico and Central America and around the region. So it's not possible to stop that completely. And because of the massive volume of that trade, Organized crime takes advantage of it to mix in uh, uh, some degree of drugs. I think, you know, the pressure has been to increase inspection, expand inspection, but every time that inspection is increased, uh, it slows down trade. Uh, it makes it more difficult. So I think uh, what, what people have tried to focus on is continuing to monitor borders and use that as we can, but not see the border as the ultimate solution to the problem of drug trafficking. Because uh, organized crime uses maritime, uses aerial, uses other forms of trafficking, and better to look at it for it downstream uh, and not just at the border. I think those are the greater opportunities. You mentioned, uh, well, actually, Duncan mentioned the uh, the, the use of, of drones, and uh, we had this question before about um, transportation issues. And and you you of course have looked at Latin America widely, and some of the challenges in the uh, the Northern Triangle. Uh, what are the transportation issues there? And if if there are any, uh, how are they? Are they also using the sea routes? Uh, in Central America as well? Yes, um, uh, you know, there are three, you know, uh, basic ways, uh, it's obvious, land, sea, and air. Uh, air uh, trafficking is probably the small, is by far the smallest of those three, but there are times in which air trafficking, use of, of uh, airplanes and so on increases. Uh, the recent uh, uh, um, International Narcotic Strategy Control Report from the Department of State pointed out that aerial trafficking of drugs into Guatemala has increased dramatically. On the other hand, the use of uh, maritime sea lanes uh, continues to be the preferred method of trafficking uh, in cocaine. That happens to going south, uh, land pa uh, passage, is often slow, uh, but it's also very difficult to detect uh, drugs uh, going uh, in 18 wheelers crossing major international borders. Uh, and of course, uh, using boats out at sea uh, is also a pretty effective way uh, to move drugs. Um, you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that over the years, the more we focus on the sea lanes, the more the drug traffickers use land. And the more we focus on land, the more they use air or sea. So they're constantly moving around and changing their strategies as a reflection of what the US and, and Latin Americans are doing as well. And that's why I was going to, their ability to adapt to the market, to disruptions uh, is quite remarkable. And so we can expect that to continue to happen.
And a very quick answer, if I could, from you, Eric, before we move yeah. on to, uh, to, to uh, Louis Shelley. Um, do these groups in Latin America, do they come out of this COVID-19 situation stronger or about the same as they were, or do they, they end up weaker? Well, I, I, you know, this would be completely speculative on my part, but I, I think, you know, they'll probably come out stronger uh, uh, in most cases, certainly in Central America, where we see very weak states, by and large, uh, unable to deal with a public health care crisis at the same time there's growing trafficking problems. So I'm worried about the potential long-term impact. Thank you, Eric. And I want to move to our next panelist, who is uh, Louise Shelley, who uh, is a former Kennan Institute scholar, uh, former in uh, Kennan Institute fellow at the Wilson Center. She is currently the Omer and Nancy Hurst Endowed Chair at George Mason University. She is in the Shar School of Policy and Government and directs the Terrorism, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center, which she founded. She's a leading expert on the relationship among terrorism, organized crime, and terrorism with a particular focus uh, on the former Soviet Union. And she also specializes in illicit financial flows and money laundering. She was also the inaugural Carnegie Fellow, an Andrew Carnegie Fellow, and has a book called Dark Commerce, How a New Illicit Economy is Threatening Our Future. This is on illicit trade, new technologies, and sustainability, and it was published in November of 2018, so check that out. Uh, very interested to hear what you have to tell us because we uh, just brushed a little bit on cybercrime, and, uh, and I, I really think that this presentation is going to start to bring and uh, a lot of what we've already talked about together, introduce some new topics, and maybe even uh, bridge us into the next panel. So, uh, Louise Shelley, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Um. I'm very glad to be here with you, and I have very warm memories of all my time at the, at the Wilson Center. Now, the, what is really important to understand are some of the issues that we um, have been brought out by the previous speakers. And the importance that we see in the relationship between the state and corruption, as well as some of the changes that we're seeing in, in the cyber world. Because as people are cut, cut off and can't access international supply chains, they can have much greater success in working in the cyber world. And this was referred to in reference to Latin America but it is one of the areas in which I've come across this problem because Russian cyber criminals are often very, very strong uh, professionals. As we talked about Latin America and we talk about corruption that was mentioned before, and as Duncan Wood talked about how the the criminals have become service providers and gained favor with the state, we're looking at a system where corruption has allowed the criminals to operate and infiltrate the state. In Russia, there's a very different situation, is that cyber criminals who are often identified by foreign governments are recruited by the state. We talked today about the possibilities that have come with the COVID epidemic of selling pharmaceuticals and PPE online. And one of the uh, archetypes of this cyber criminals recruited by the state is a case of one of the criminals who ran one of the largest, largest online pharmaceutical networks who eventually was arrested not for running and selling an online pharmaceutical market, but for something else and he was recruited by the state and now runs the national payment system of Russia. One of the things that we also need to think about is that how does state policy and economic policy affect organized crime? It is not just a question of state weakness, but how does the state go in to help the business community? And in Russia today, 
the present failure of the state to bail out small businesses and in a favor in the oligarchs may result in small business owners becoming indebted to organized crime, as has been the case in Italy in past crises. Because the point that both Duncan and Eric made is that organized crime is rich in cash. And this is a phenomenon around the world in that they are often running cash rich businesses and cash based businesses. And so when a crisis comes and people are in need of cash, they then uh, are forced to turn to organized crime to keep their businesses afloat. Sometimes that's a prelude to organized crime influence of their business, and sometimes it is a prelude to organized crime absolutely taking over the business. Another very important characteristic of Russian organized crime, its involvement with a phenomenon called corporate raiding. And that is where powerful individuals take over the businesses of rivals, often through the use of organized crime. And that ex helps explain why cybercrime is so important in Russia, because despite this enormous cyber talent, there is very little significant entrepreneurship in the tech space. And so many of them go to the bar dark side. Official Russian statistics point out to the fact that 100 to 200,000 Russian businessmen are imprisoned annually. And this is how, in part, they are neutralized while their businesses are taken over. But in these facilities where COVID-19 is raging, um, many businessmen will do anything to escape exposure to the disease. So that's a, something that we need to be watching, is what is going on and how are businesses changing and being consolidated and how are they giving up resources to organize crime in this period of, of great economic difficulty in Russia. Another issue that's very similar to what we were talking about in regards to Mexico and Central America is the disruption of supply chains in Russia. As I've mentioned, they have run and have been major suppliers of illicit and unregular pharmaceuticals, medical supplies. And though they're still out there advertising them extensively in the cyber world, they are cut off from their supply chains, which are often in China and India, and therefore they're having problems as sellers in cyberspace. So these are some of the things to think about and how this supply chain issue is not just an issue in Latin America, but around the world for, for organized criminals. Thinking about disruption of supply chains. Let's look at this PowerPoint here, which is a slide of sale of fentanyl, which has been done online and is sold from China to the US. Some of the fentanyl goes through Mexico, as we've mentioned, and is processed and then shipped across the border with more difficulty now. But this is a direct shipment. And as you can see from what I have circled, this is a slide in February, where the supply chain was interrupted and the supplies could not travel. So we're seeing phenomena that are disrupting cyber businesses as well as online businesses. There was also a problem mentioned by both Duncan and Eric of the difficulties of laundering money. But there's a new industry, or there is an existing industry of something called money mules. And money mules are people who are not part of the criminal world that are often recruited to help move financial transactions through their own uh, accounts. And this is a lot of what is growing at the present time in our economy 
as these Latin American groups and other criminals need to dispose of these financial assets. And I'm affiliated with the Stina Center, which is a DHS center at George Mason. We're about to re release a report this week of um, how criminal networks are responding to COVID. And there's a whole section that I and some of my students wrote on the problem of money mules because one tenth of my class had been approached to be money mules and help ease this problem of money laundering. And some of that is going on in Hispanic communities in the US as the Mexican and Latin American groups are trying to move their money. When you look at a slide of this online sales, much of these sales are going, not just going on in cryptocurrencies, but they're going through state financial institutions, through banks. And one of the concerns we need to be thinking about is our states, our countries, going to be so desperate for income at the present time that they will not crack down on these illicit websites, platforms that are helping bring money into their country when they so desperately need money from exports. And that's a very important thing to think about because we're often dealing in many parts of the world with non-state actors that become state affiliated criminals. There's a long history of this that goes back to the days of piracy, but it's still very much alive in the world today and is something we need to be thinking about of how we combat this problem when there may be increasing state complicity in fostering financial transactions through state institutions. We also were talking a little bit about increased fraud and the vulnerability of state handouts and state, I shouldn't say handouts, but state resources being transferred to the citizenry at this crucial time. And in Washington state, it was announced very recently that the unemployment fund has had massive problems of stolen identities. And many of these stolen identities that are stolen by cyber criminals, sometimes state supported, sometimes non-state actors, are sold in something called the dark web. And criminals around the world buy these identities and then proceed to commit crimes with them. In this case, Washington state is suggesting or that this may be Nigerian organized crime that is perpetrating these frauds against the Washington state system. But probably it is a variety of diverse actors that are involved in targeting our country at this vulnerable time. So what we're really looking at is a very diverse picture. And the mother most disturbing phenomenon that I see today is the huge rise of child exploitation online as people are at home and there is less possibility of engaging in in-person human trafficking. There is more visual images being sold and the numbers have gone up in the hundreds of percentile since hundreds of percent in this period since people are confined during the pandemic epidemic. So we really need to be paying much more attention to what is going on in cyberspace and understanding the impacts of supply chains because maybe we will be able to cut back and learn lessons from cutting off supply chains that can help us make us more strong in the future when supply chains are functioning again. So maybe this is not only a negative moment, but there are important lessons that can be learned as we strengthen our capacities to deal with the present crises. Thank you, Louise. That's, that's fascinating. Um, the, you mentioned Washington State, um, and this you know, 
is a challenge that is not just at federal, you know, you know, large government levels. This is down to local and state governments. And I'm wondering, is, are there new strategies that are being developed to fight this type of crime? Or do you see that governments uh, are slow to react and are not having uh, as much impact because they aren't able to react and turn very quickly uh, when these new types of strategies come out? In one of the problems I identified in dark commerce is the problem of the failure of governments to launch strategies to, to basically crime proof them when they're doing so much online. When Europe introduced online carbon market trade, they wound up with a $5 billion crime committed against different countries in the EU because they didn't think about this. And we have launched so much of our relief programs and assistance programs in the cyber world without thinking enough about how clever our transnational criminals are, how much they've been preparing for this day by stealing and trading identities. Well, it's fascinating, and I think uh, you know when you talk about the you know illicit actors. I think sometimes we think about terrorist groups and cartels and, and uh, money launderers, and we forget that you know this is a this is an incredible opportunity for uh, phishing scams to increase and for cybercrime and things to be sold on the dark web, as you said. Uh, and it's certainly something that we can't forget about. And where that money goes to often is to uh, to fund the, the, the physical non-state actors that we're often talking about. Absolutely. And we have, we've seen increases in ransomware attacks that have gone against hospitals that are trying to teach, treat COVID patients. It is an enormous growth area and the number of individuals that are being scammed is very severe in this country as well. And as you correctly pointed out, having a decentralized system in the United States with very different degrees of readiness to deal with cybercrime um, makes us all the more vulnerable. Well, thank you, uh, Louise, and thank you, Eric. Thank you to Duncan, uh, who, who had to, to jump off of here. But this has been an excellent first panel. Uh, to those who are uh, watching, certainly, uh, if there are further questions, you know, we, we have these experts that are that are here all the time. I would invite you to check out uh, Louise's book, um, The Dark Commerce, which you just mentioned. Uh, certainly sounds like an interesting read, especially in light of everything that we're having to deal with right now. Uh, there's so much out there uh, that the, these these folks can take advantage of these opportunities that COVID-19 presents. Thank you to our panelists on our first panel. We will uh, just pause here momentarily uh, while we get our second panel together. So please stay with us and uh, we will be right back. <laughs> 